Uh, my name is Jervon. Uh, thanks for coming to this talk. Uh, the original title was Relevance of Closure Script, but I have since changed it to Land of Closure Script. Uh, we'll probably discuss why that happened later. Um, <clears throat> so this is the second to last talk of the day, so I figured you guys would be fried or tired, so I put some jokes in here. Uh, so if you know the answer to this joke, don't yell it out yet. Uh, let some folks have some time to think about it. So it's what do you get when you merge a rhino and an elephant? Does anyone know? You should shout it out. No, it's elephino. Well, you got to say it fast and, and, uh, and loud. Um, and then my coworker gave me this uh, scrambled word the other day. Um, it's P-Y-T-E, and you have to unscramble it. It only matches one word in the dictionary. Type? Ah, oh, you guys are smart. <laughs> Took me a while to figure that out. Um, cool. Uh, so this is a quote uh, by Rich Hickey, who made Closure and Closure Script. Uh, it's programming is not about typing, it's about thinking. And um, I think a lot about why you would pick Closure Script or something that composites to JavaScript kind of resonates with this quote. Um, just picking the right tool for the, the right job. Um, so about two years ago, I got introduced to Clojure. And um, I tried it. And it was a little difficult. I, I didn't play with a list before. Um, and then I saw a talk by David Nolan on Clojure Script. I was like, this looks interesting. Uh, he showed off some uh, really cool tools. And I was like, I'm going to play with this. Uh, but when I started looking, there was only this book. Uh, which was kind of old, uh, a little outdated. Um, and it was like that for some time. Uh, and then recently, uh, Closure Script started picking up uh, traction um, with things like Ohm and uh, just bigger companies starting to use Closure Script. Uh, now, Closure Script has more stars on GitHub than Closure itself. Um, I'm not going to say this number means anything, uh, but it definitely shows that Closure Script is, is uh, picking up um, some momentum. Um, so first, we'll start with a, a tiny demo. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, I was introducing a friend to Closure Script. And he's like, well, if, it has to, if you have to ship the entire library, uh, isn't that going to be huge or not going to be a pain for the, the end user? Uh, but Closure Script, being pragmatic, has uh, compilation modes. And this is a Hello World uh, example. It's just, just console.log. Um, and you can see, maybe not, uh, hold on, that it's not that big. Um, it didn't even register in Chrome. And it took one millisecond to load. And that's just Hello World. There is a lot of code in here for just Hello World. Uh, but that's just what comes with, with Closure Script. And I think the benefit that this provides, Closure Script provides, outweighs the, any disadvantage that you might get with uh, weight of a library. Uh, cool. So new school JavaScript. So how many people use JavaScript here? Sweet. And how many people use Closure Script or Closure? Uh, cool. Um, and what type of apps do you all build? You can just shout it out. It's like, what does it do? No takers, shout out what your app does. All right. Light HTML player. Light HTML player, cool. Um, all right, so JavaScript is everywhere. Uh, JavaScript is on the back end with Node. Uh, you can do Node bots with JavaScript. And it's on the front end. Uh, there are lots of legacy apps that run JavaScript. Uh, and the JavaScript core team has to support all of this. So they're not going to get to all the warts that are in JavaScript. Uh, they are doing a really good job to fix it, um, but it's going to be a slow process. Also, JavaScript isn't going to satisfy all of your needs, right? So if you need immutability, ClojureScript is a good choice. If you need types on the front end, PureScript is a good choice. And there has to be a reason that all these people are building 
something that compiles to JavaScript. Um, <clears throat> so I think that we should start treating JavaScript as a runtime. So things that compile down to JavaScript and provides features that uh, you need. So what is ClojureScript? Uh, ClojureScript is a compiler that, for Clojure that targets the JavaScript, uh, that targets JavaScript. So what that means, it'll take a Clojure code, compile it down, and you get JavaScript in the end. Uh, why did I pick ClojureScript? Uh, well, it's a Lisp, and I really wanted to learn a Lisp. It, was a, it felt like I would get the most bang for my buck. Uh, I could probably get hired doing Clojure um, instead of something that's older. Um, ClojureScript is well designed. A lot of times when you use JavaScript, you might put that GIF in, uh, in HipChat or Slack because you're like, oh, what's happening? And if something has a book that says the good parts, it probably has some bad parts in it or lots of bad parts. Um, all the parts in Clojure are awesome. At least I think so. So you got namespaces. I'm just going to list some things uh, right off the bat. You, know, you don't have to wait for ES6 or all that stuff. Uh, macros. I get great library support. Um, Ohm, Google Clojure, which is super confusing, but it's Clojure with an S, not a J. Um, so now we're going to go through some basics just so everyone has a baseline of what ClojureScript looks like. <laughs> this is how you would call a function. Uh, so we have a list of lists, and the innards will get evaluated first, so 2 multiplied by 3, and then you'd have plus 1. So it's inside out. And in JavaScript, this would be 1 plus parentheses 2 times 3. Uh, this is how you would define named functions. This is a function named square. It takes one parameter x, which is in the square brackets, and the body of the functions below that. And that's what that converts to in JavaScript. Uh, you can do anonymous functions, um, and that's how you do it. Uh, basically, fn instead of giving it a name. Uh, and since JavaScript is hosted, or since ClojureScript is hosted on, in JavaScript, it has great interop support. Uh, so everything inside of JavaScript, or if you're using a JavaScript library, will be in the JS namespace. And uh, so. Here we're calling out document .get by document .get element by ID, and in the bottom we're getting a value of a property. So that would be like if you have a name on a person object or something like that. Can everybody see the code? Yeah. Cool. Um, <clears throat> and in ClojureScript, we don't do variable assignments. Um, we have local bindings, and this is how you would do a local binding with a let. So everything in the let scope uh, has access. You have access to everything in the let scope. And then the last thing we need to know about is an atom. So since ClojureScript is immutable, uh, they realize that you will need to manage state at some point, and you do that with an atom. So think of an atom as a box, and you have things in the box, and you could take, you could take things out of the box, but you can't change the thing that you're taking out. So you could take your shoe out of the box, would not change the shoelaces or anything like that. <clears throat> so JavaScript is an asynchronous language, right? It supports this, this type of uh, workflow. And the world is, is built on processes, and JavaScript handles that. So like when, you, when something happens, do this. So like when you water the plant, the plant should grow. Uh, but the problem with callbacks is uh, it just hides um, all your logic, or it, it allows you to put all your logic in this callback that's hidden, and it kind of uh, encourages you to hide certain things or mutate state in there. And then you might be thinking to yourself that, you know, I don't write that code, um, but someone else will on your team or someone else on, a, on another code base will, and you still have to use it, and it'll be hard to parse and hard to understand, and bring up bugs and stuff. So you actually end up having this. This might be a really bad case, uh, but code similar to this. And I googled callback hell, and there's a site dedicated to callback hell uh, describing what it is. So it's definitely a problem. So Clojure provides uh, this library called core async. 
And it's an implementation of uh, communicating sequential processes. And what this means is just message passing via uh, an idea of channels. And a channel is similar to a blocking queue and it responds to events and talks to processes. So in ClojureScript, this is how you would new up a channel. And we're gonna go through an example in a bit. Uh, so you could put things on a channel or you could, and you use the keyword put uh, or the sugar of the greater than bang sign. And you can take things off a channel. And then there's this go block. And this is the magic of the core async library. It turns all your code in the go block into a state machine. So you don't have to use a callback to do inversion of control. So inversion of control just means that <clears throat> when you click a button and it finishes, JavaScript knows to go back to your callback and do the, the, handle the code in your callback. Uh, but the Go macro does that for you. So you don't have to, to handle that. So here's an example. So with core async, you write sequential logic. So here we're saying, we have a channel already set up somewhere in our code base, and we're gonna print, we're waiting for something. And then we have a listener and a button, which is the clicks channel. And we click, so we take something off the channel, and then the code continues. So it's a state machine. Um, so what happens is, the go block starts, looks for all your code, um, all the channel code in your, in your block, and it parks it when it's waiting for, it blocks when it's waiting for something, and then it parks. So blocking would be if waiting executed the first line, and then no clicks came through. So you can imagine something like a credit card form. If you click submit, you could pause all events on that channel and not let anything up not let anything through. So you don't have to look for the DOM, look through the DOM for state or anything. Basically you just pause your channel and park it. Or if you have a video player or something like that. <coughs> Any questions around Core Async? No? All right, so I'm gonna, I have some tiny demos, but I'm gonna show a bigger demo. Um, do, do, do. Of how I'm using this. So, can everyone see this? Fine? Okay. So, this is Ohm, and we're going to talk about this later. Um, so, Ohm has an app state, and the way you could use Core Async with it is you set up a channel as part of the state. I'm trying to find that. All right, it's right here. So over here, in the state, we give the state a delete key, and we give it a channel. And then when you click the delete key, or the delete button, we send this event to this channel. And basically what this allows us to do is encapsulate all our delete logic in one spot into our app. So if you were to have another delete button somewhere else, uh, it uses the same channel and you don't have to have any duplication or anything. So with CoreaSync, you start thinking more in processes and less in callbacks. And uh, things start talking to each other in processes. So it allows you to think differently. So that's pretty much CoreaSync. And now we're gonna go on to uh, state and mutation. So in JavaScript, it also supports you to do mutation on your objects. All your objects are uh, mutating. So say you're using a library and you call a method, you can't rely that your, your object that's coming back is the same that you sent down. So this also leads to bugs and all sorts of silly cases. So you can't do this in uh, JavaScript, right? Even though there, it's the same value in the object, it's still a different object because they point to different parts of uh, memory. So this returns false, even though it should be true. And if you wanted to do this equality, you would have to walk the object and check, check its values. But in ClojureScript, ClojureScript treats everything uh, like a value. So these you get this equality check for free. 
Uh, similar in JavaScript, uh, you know the number five is never going to change. It's always going to be the number five. So that gives you a safety. Um, this is what I was talking about earlier. You're using some external library that has a method called process. Uh, maybe your object's going to come back with the same values and you could keep using it, but probably not. So this is what that code looks like in ClosureScript. So we call process on ages, and we're guaranteed that ages will still be the same. So there's this cool tool called React, uh, developed by Facebook, that's been uh, getting some traction, a little bit of traction. Uh, and React allows you to build uh, user interfaces. Uh, you can think of it as the V in MVC. Uh, React is known for very quick rendering and uh, components, and this is, what, this is how it works. So basically, when you load your app, you give React these components, and React builds um, a virtual DOM of JavaScript objects. And then when you make a change in the DOM, uh, React will build another virtual DOM and do a, a diff of those two, and only send down the subset of those changes. So here we're saying before, a p tag of before, and a p tag of after do a diff and only send down that P to the real DOM. So the magic of React is it doesn't uh, do anything with the browser DOM because the browser DOM is a little slow. Uh, so it gets this really fast rendering from the virtual DOM. So for those of you that are paying attention, uh, you might think, well, this probably will go great with, uh, with ClojureScript and someone the core maintainer of ClojureScript, uh, David Nolan, created this library called Ohm. And there are other uh, things that talk to React, uh, but this serves the purpose for a demo. And this is an interface to ClojureScript's, uh, Facebook's React. And I think Ohm and React go together like chicken and waffles, which uh, is one of my favorite, favorite foods. So let's walk through this real quick. So this is a tiny app that I built uh, using Ohm and ClojureScript. Uh, so there are some components on the page. The undo button is a component. Uh, the form is a component. And the list of contacts is a component. And each contact is also a component. Um, and I showed you some code earlier with the delete button using query sync. So the client came to me and they said, I have a list of movie stars and I want to track them, but sometimes I get really angry and I will delete them, um, but then I regret it and I want to bring them back. So we have, you can see I deleted Johnny and I could hit undo and get Johnny back. And we're not doing that through the DOM or anything. We're doing that by tracking the application state. So with Ohm and React, you're allowed to track state through time so basically, you could think of basically a function, and you give it a state. So this state has three contact or four con three contacts, and then if I delete it, it has two now, and then I could just undo or go back to the the last state. And this is handled through um, Closure Scripts immutable data structures. So below, you can see I'll make it bigger. I'm logging out the app state, and this is the entire state of the app. Um, and you can see there's a key, contacts. And how this works is, so you have a structure, which is a vector, and it represents each state. And then when you want to undo, you pop the last value, and you go back. And that's all you need to do for uh, undoing. So you can imagine that with this, you can, if you have a bug in your interface or something, someone could just, you can keep saving each state of the app, and you can say, well, when did you have it? And load that state, and you can see the user's interface at that point in time. Um, or things of like, uh, you know, if you purchase something and you want to undo it, or uh, rendering lots of information, things like a CI tool would be good for this, uh, which has a lot of state. Any questions around uh, Ohm or React? So um, if I wanted to serialize a portion of the app and it's using HTML5 authenticate, let's say you want to just start the tournament something like that, 
Okay. Is there an ABS in, uh, in the home So I'm not sure for that specific case, but you can serialize closure script objects to JavaScript objects uh, using, uh, there's a macro called CLJS to JS. And you can go the opposite direction to JavaScript to closure script. Um, cool. Any other questions? No? All right, moving on. I feel like I'm blowing through this. Uh, so there was supposed to be a talk uh, at Strangeloop about transducers, um, but it's not happening anymore, so I figured I should mention it, uh, being part of like the awesomeness of ClojureScript. So a transducer is just a composable uh, transformer. So think of um, how many of you use like Ramda or underscore JS. So you can have you have uh, functions like map and filter. You could build up those things without passing in a collection. So, so let's say you have a list of users, and you want to map you want to filter them uh, by role. You would have to map over them and save that uh, collection, and then filter over that new collection with the transducer. You build up the transformation first. So let's step through it. So here you have an isAdmin function, and we're just going to check if the role is admin. And then we map over, or we get a full, we're given a record, we generate a full name. So the, the record has a first name and a last name. And then we compose a list of transformations. Uh, so first we check, we filter out only admins and then we map over and get a full name. So basically, this is a very powerful tool because, so say you wanted to find all the red cars that were like BMWs. You could pass in an argument and build up these transformations slowly and not uh, have to pass in the collection at the point in time or anything like that. It also uh, does a performance benefit because uh, you don't have to build a collection on every iteration. It uses the same one. So it's pretty cool. Uh, while preparing this talk, I had a wild idea. Not really a wild idea, but um, I was like, if you really, someone really likes Clojure, they probably won't build a command line tool in it because of the JVM startup time. But ClojureScript supports Node.js. So you can build a tool with Node.js and then make an executable and have a, a command line app. So I built a, a tiny little one. It's not impressive. Um, but it does, uh, it gives you a fake credit card number. So when you're testing credit cards, you don't have to like go to Stripe and get the number. Um, and that's basically you just say uh, fake CC and give it a credit card name. And it's pretty fast, no JVM startup time, and you get to still live in Lisp land. Lisp land. And if you give it a not real credit card, I'll give you a friendly message. Um, and we could look at that code. So this is basically all that needs to happen. I'm using Node's process library, using the JS namespace, uh, getting the, the arguments passed in from the command line and then just doing a case statement. And you have a command line app using Node. That's fast. And you could probably use Core Async, Core Logic, and all the other closure script libraries that supports on the command line. So I'm probably going to explore this some more after this talk. Um, any questions around? Is there a closure script Yes, I will be going through that in a little bit. Um, all right, so the, I'm going to go through like three questions that people have asked me over and over. Um, so debugging. Uh, usually the biggest complaint, or one of the biggest complaints of using something that compiles to JavaScript is uh, the code is all mangled and you don't know where the bug is. Uh, but ClojureScript has great uh, source mapping. So let's look at this. So earlier in the app that I was showing you, um, I left a logging statement when I add a contact. So I'm going to add, add myself 
please don't call me. Um, you can see this, this is tiny, but I'm logging out building a contact. And I'm like, where did I leave this log, uh, console.log statement? And I could look for it uh, using like git grep. But if I just click the, the file name, it takes me directly to the closure script file in the browser. Um, and to the line number, and you can see see what it is. Um, so that's source maps, and it works for more clever examples too. Um, and then Trevor asked about well, first we're going to go over this fig wheel. So how many people went to Bruce talks Bruce's talk yesterday? Yeah. So fig wheel is pretty awesome. Uh, it's basically hot code reloading. Uh, so let's see if I could. Do this. So here's the browser, and then here's my shell, and then let's see. So I have a REPL open. Well, let's let's look at the code first. Um, so we have this button add contact, and let's pretend I spelt it wrong. I could come over here and delete the word contact. And you see it refreshed without me doing anything. And add, it's now changed to add. So imagine like building a game or something. You just split screen and have it going. Um, and it also works for CSS. So if I said style CSS, uh, My CSS is a little messed up, so I have to use the word important. So don't judge me, please. And it turned red, right? So imagine just like a real-time feedback workflow. Uh, he also mentioned a tool called Def Cards, which is pretty cool. Um, it allows you to kind of visualize your state and your interface at the same time. All right, so I use Emacs, and I have a built-in REPL um, here. And so this is the running app, the running server. So I can type browser REPL. And now I'm connected to REPL. I just have to refresh the page. And then I could basically communicate with the DOM or the page in any, any way, shape, or form. Uh, from the REPL. So you can think of like if you're writing an OM comp, uh, a component in OM, you could basically evaluate it in the REPL and it'll show up in the browser without checking anything. Um, or if you're writing a function and you want to see what it uh, evaluates to, just run it in the REPL from, from your editor. And there's REPL support for IntelliJ, uh, Lighttable, and some other Vim, other editors. Um, cool. So we went over browser REPL. Uh, so integrating with JavaScript. So I, I have not tried to integrate ClojureScript into a JavaScript app yet, but I have tried using JavaScript uh, libraries with ClojureScript. And the way you do this is through something called an extern which is uh, basically a file that tells Google Clojure, which is a tool that compiles your Clojure script, not to mess with those functions so you have access to it. So basically, if you had like a user library, uh, this is what the file would look like. So you'd say, leave the user object alone uh, and the full name function. And then in Clojure script, you can access it in the JS namespace. So JS slash user and any function that you externed. And there's this awesome site called CLJSJS, which is a movement to port all the popular JavaScript libraries to uh, be compatible with ClojureScript. Uh, so if you have one and it's not in there, you should contribute um, and give back to the community. Uh, what's next? Uh, so a summary. I'm done. That was quick. Uh, so I think we should start being able to be OK with it saying it's OK not to use JavaScript. Because yes, JavaScript is awesome. And, but there are other tools that uh, provide different functionalities that will be useful to you. 
so yeah, I will post these slides, and these are some links uh, that are very useful that help me. Um, and yeah, we should pair program if you want to get into Closure Script uh, or Closure uh, or anything. If you want to teach me something or want me to teach you something, um, you can find me on Twitter at Jervon. And I have this little podcast called Turing Not Cool with some friends. If you want a sticker, uh, feel free to hit me up. Uh, so yeah, I will be happy to answer any questions. I think we have how much time? Lots of time. So any questions of use cases or things like that? Um, have you used uh, like cross compilation in like the CLK, CLK stuff? No. no. Is that the stuff for like running it on .NET and stuff? No. no. Like if you have a function that is written in pure closure, okay. you can compile it no, I have not used that. I have been wondering about that, though. Have you? Uh, we've, we've tried. Okay. Sort of okay. okay. What are you using ClojureScript for, or Clojure? Uh, we, we built a tool that helps us estimate projects. Okay. And so there's like some common functions on the server side. We wanted to push to the client side, and then it, like not having like mass libraries for client level, only JavaScript and Java. Okay. Problem. Interesting. Any other, you had a question? Yeah, so um, you mentioned earlier that the, the Riley book uh, drops, or uh, closure script for uh, out of date. Do you have any other recommendations? There's an open source uh, book that there's a link to. Um, hold on, sorry. Uh, it's by FunCool. Uh, last time I checked, it wasn't finished. Uh, but there are two closure script books, uh, closure books that came out recently. Closure Applied, which was free earlier, and uh, Living Closure uh, by Karen, who gave the chemical computing talk. Um, they have mentions of uh, closure script. And if you know closure, you pretty much know closure script. Uh, you just need to be aware of like the uh, kind of JavaScript world a little bit. And closure script now sort of supports React Native. But we'll see where that goes, which is building iOS apps with ClojureScript. You talked about library support. How have you found uh, being able to use other libraries that are designed for JavaScript or for iOS and not? So it can be difficult, but with the CLJS yeah. and the externs, I mean, the power is pretty much in your hands. I guess I was thinking more about the actual kind of modeling thing. So I understand okay. you know, the interrupt. Okay. For certain libraries, yes. Uh, so recently, a friend and I were trying to implement something with 3.js. And 3.js mutates everything. And it was just going against how ClojureScript uh, does things. And the way we solved it, well, the, this specific problem is just wrapping the thing that happened, like putting like an immutable layer between ClojureScript and JavaScript, uh, 3.js. Um, so all the, you, I guess the advice I would have for you is sort of put all your mutation in one spot so that you know how to isolate it, basically. So. ClojureScript is really hard to get started with, at least when I started. Um, basically, like, I think Clojure's people are really smart and they don't uh, write documentation or things that relate to uh, or at least back in the day. Now there are tools like uh, Mize, I, I think I'm saying it right, which you just say, you use the build tool line again, say line Mize, and you, you have a JavaScript project up and running. Um, so, yeah. There's also a closer Slack. That's pretty helpful. So, yeah. Any other questions? I'll go back there first. Yeah. Um, so I do not use it in production. This is basically a toy for me. Uh, but on the ClojureScript GitHub page, they show who uses it. Um, why isn't my thing working? Uh, I'll just talk. Uh, so CircleCI, which is a really big CI tool, it's fun to use. Um, they use it. Uh, their front end is open source, and you can look at it on GitHub. Uh, there's a company called Prismatic, I think, that is like a reader app. Uh, they do it. Uh, there's a startup that does like a real-time drawing app. I forget the name, but they 
uh, also use closed script. Anything that has a lot of state uh, management and mutation would be a good choice. I think so. Or at least more traction into the uh, world. Um, so you were showing examples of home. Have you played around with uh, reagent at all? Have you got some of the genes or spots on I do not. Uh, I stick to ohm. Uh, but I know there are other talks that talk about the differences between like reagent and quiescent and uh, ohm. Yeah. Really have an opinion on that. So. Anything else? No. Who's going to use it? Who's convinced? Sweet. And you should. You can. You have free reign to steal my joke also, because that joke's funny. Uh, all right. Thanks, guys, and everyone.